It is Mother's Day weekend. Welcome to all of you online. Glad you can join us too. And all of you here in person get to uh, enjoy this with us. Uh, every Mother's Day for the last several years, except for last year. I, I just was curious. I went back and looked at last Mother's Day and I did the message from my couch. That was COVID time, right? Um, but, but every year besides that, we have done baby dedications at Community. Come on, what are you afraid? Get over here. <laughs> The light, I don't want to eat. Yeah, I don't want to do Well, hi. How are you, buddy? All right. This is Owen, and this is Cash. And uh, one of the things that we do at Baby Dedication Time is uh, we, we do want to set these children apart. We want to dedicate them. Their families uh, picked out special verses for them that go along with them and their, their prayer for them uh, as a family. And uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to take some time to pray as well. I have that effect on a lot of people, actually. It's a, don't, I don't take it personal anymore. Uh, but there's this verse in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 that I absolutely love, and Moses is telling everybody about the law of God. But here's how it says it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And then listen to verse 7, especially parents. Listen to verse 7. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. He's just saying it's, it's the parent's duty, responsibility to share God, to share Jesus with these little boys. And so that's a part of your role as a parent. Uh, there's a really sad, troubling verse a few chapters later when we get to Judges. And uh, Joshua took over after Moses. He leads the people into the promised land. We get to the book of Judges, and there's a verse. I think it's the beginning of part of chapter 2. It says, then an entire generation that grew up that did not know God. I mean, how sad is that? Like, they didn't, they didn't pass it on to the next generation. And so our baby dedication is a time to pray for these kids, but it's also a time for to pray for these parents. And so uh, Brad and Kimmy and Corbin and Katie, uh, we're praying for you just as much as we're praying for these cute little boys. You can, you can tell they're cousins. Look at that. They look like twins. It's amazing. It's amazing. Hey, let's pray. Can you join me? God, thank you so much for these little boys and for these families. We pray, God, your blessing on them. God, each of these little boys, uh, Owen and Cash, have, uh, have been molded and shaped by you according to your word. You've given them very specific personalities and gifts and abilities that we'll see come out uh, over the years ahead. And we pray, God, that uh, they will be able to fulfill the purpose that you gave them for their life. God, be with these moms and dads. It's such a huge responsibility to be a parent, especially in today's world. And so we ask your blessing on them. God, give them that extra dose of patience and grace and wisdom. And may their example be one that these boys can follow. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And everyone, give them a round of applause. Would you do that? All right. So this one's... There's actually a, a book in there, too. Thank you, John. Yeah, there you go. This one's for you guys. Thank you. There thank you. Go. you. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. All right. Now get out. <laughs> we got things to do. No, you guys are special. Thank you so much. That's so cool. Yeah, you can give one more hand. It's awesome. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. Beautiful little boys. So cool. So cool. And uh, the quilting ministry that we've had uh, kind of behind the scenes at our church for years has made these quilts. And uh, each one is just prayed over, and then we, we pass them on to these kids. We have uh, another one at 9 o'clock on Sunday, and I think 9 or 10 more at 1045. And uh, so thank you guys uh, for being with us tonight as we do this. Uh, maybe you're watching in your pajamas, and it's Tuesday morning, but it's Thursday for us. So happy Mother's Day, whatever day this is for you. Well, let me just stay, say this as we get started. The, the Bible is fun. A lot of people don't think of it that way. But the Bible is fun. Ch check out this verse. Listen, just listen. A nagging spouse is like the drip, drip, drip of a leaky faucet. You can't turn it off, and you can't get away from it. <laughs> Come on, that's funny, right? But it's also true. So uh, for those of you who are married, let me just ask you this question. When was the last time your spouse did something that annoyed you? Don't answer out loud. But <laughs> was it last week? 
Was it earlier today? I mean, according to one book I was reading, it said this. If you're a man, it was probably last week. If you're a woman, it's right now. <laughs> it's like we're always doing something that annoys this person in our life that means everything to us. But that's true for not just in marriage, it's true in our family with our kids and our, and our parents and our aunts and uncles, cousins. It's, it's true in the, the friendships that we have that we cultivate over time. The people that mean the most to us sometimes are the ones that we can irritate the most, that we can, we can bother. And one of the things that that does is it makes a withdrawal from what we call the love bank. And I'll explain that as we get into this further, but this series, we're calling it the love bank, has all about these, these key relationships in our life. And one of the things I want to do to kind of get us started is uh, I want us to just clear up something because some people say, well, I should be able to do whatever I want to do because that's the way I'm weird. In fact, some people really spiritual say, that's the way God made me. Well, God didn't make you annoying. Now, you might think that, that that personality, you know, trait that you have, that, that makes you, you know, special and everybody else is annoyed by it. It may be that that's not a God thing in you. It may be something you, you got to work on. Like, I got stuff I got to work on. But just so that we get this, I, I want to make sure that we're really clear. Uh, what, what's the difference between a withdrawal and a deposit? So a deposit is a really good thing, something good that we do that makes somebody feel, you know, closer to us. This is especially true in marriage, but it is a, a special weekend, so I want to kind of relate it that way, but it's not the only way we're going to relate this, okay? So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to make a statement, and you all have to say out loud, and those of you at home can do this too, you say out loud whether it's a withdrawal or a deposit, okay? Does this make sense? If it's a withdrawal, it's not a good thing. I'm going to help you out, all right? If it's a deposit, it's a good thing, all right? So just, just to get us started, losing your temper with someone you love, withdrawal or deposit? It's a withdrawal, all right? Okay, how about buying flowers for no particular reason? That's usually a deposit. I say usually because uh, I know people who don't like flowers, Right? They feel like they, they're going to die in two days anyway. Don't waste the money on flowers. You know, so, so if you give them flowers, they're like, didn't, didn't we talk about this? It's not, a, it's not a deposit. But in most cases, it's, it's a deposit. How about buying flowers for Mother's Day? That's a deposit most of the time. How about buying flowers for your mom because you blew your temper and you want to make up? Still a deposit. It's not a trick question. If your mom likes flowers, that's a good thing, right? What about this? In any relationship... You keep a promise. That's a deposit, right? How about you take out the trash without being asked? That's a deposit. That's big time right there. How about calling someone you love names to make them feel worse about themselves? Withdrawal. Okay, these are obvious, right? I want to make sure we're on track here. How about encouraging your mom after someone else made her feel bad? That's a deposit, yeah. How about making your mom cook and clean on Mother's Day? I'm, this is Thursday service. I'm giving you guys a heads up. Like, we got some work to do before Sunday when it's officially Mother's Day. But, but, but the thing is, we can, um, in a crazy way, hurt and annoy the ones that we love the most, and we can almost, like, do it the easiest with them if we're not careful. So this is going to take some work for us. But this whole series, we're going to be really, really practical. And maybe every week we could read this verse. But I want to read a passage out of Philippians chapter 2. And maybe, maybe it sets the stage. Maybe it gives us some groundwork or, or some footing for, for making sure that we build this on the right idea. But, but Philippians 2, beginning in verse 3, says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, and that's such a key, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. But this is what sometimes people say. Well, you got to just let me be me, man. I mean, if you really love me, you just let me be me. No, it, it said, let let your, your mindset, your attitude be the same as Christ. Christ didn't say, let me be me. Otherwise, he would have stayed in heaven. But he put on human flesh, was crucified for us. He went through the pain of all of that for us. Like, just let me be me means I don't want to make any changes. But, but if we're going to be in a relationship with anybody, it's going to require us to make some changes in order for the relationship to work. 
So I just got a handful of things I want you to think through. And the first one is this. I want us to make a commitment. This is like week one, right out of the gate, the love bank. But we're going to all, all of us are going to do this. We're going to make a commitment now that we're going to work on this stuff that we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. And, and I hope and pray that it's so practical. You'll not just come back every week or tune in every week, but you'll invite some other people to join you because you realize that this could help them or it could help you together as a friendship or as a, as a part of a family. But as we think about a commitment, I want to think about it in terms of, of a covenant, not a contract. The Bible talks about covenants. And the idea of a covenant is that we're seeking the absolute best for the other person. It's going to require something of us. In fact, God has a covenant with us. It required of him everything. So a contract is kind of that, that piece of paper we sign, we, we agree, and then we're looking for the loopholes. Like, well, I want to get out of it if I can get out of it, right? That's not a commitment. That's not what we're really talking. We're talking about really a covenant kind of a commitment here. And in order to do that, we've got to make sure that our, our commitment is based on the wisdom of God. Um, way, way before I was born, honestly, some of you think I'm old enough, but I don't remember ice houses. I've read about them. Some of you maybe lived up in the north, and maybe they still have them functioning somewhere. This is before, like, refrigeration. But they would have these thick-walled houses, and then they would have them like built down into the ground a little bit so that it was like naturally like secure and there's no windows and a super tightly fit door was a part of this whole thing. And then they have these huge blocks of ice that would go in there. And that's where they would store meat and things like that that they needed to keep cold. They didn't have a refrigerator or a freezer, a deep freeze. They had these ice houses. And so along with the, the, the uh, ice, there would be sawdust. And I didn't read far enough why, but maybe it keeps the ice from melting. That's my guess. Anybody know? Yeah, let's just pretend that that's the reason there's a bunch of sawdust in there. And so these guys, I guess, were working one time in this story I was reading, and uh, a guy lost a very valuable watch in one of those ice houses. They went back in, and they looked all over, but there's enough sawdust, they just couldn't find it. And finally, they, they left, and a little boy goes in there, and after a while, he comes out with a watch. And they're like, how did you do that? And he says, well, it wasn't easy, but I decided a watch is going to make some noise. So I just laid down on the sawdust and I was as quiet as I could be. And then after a while, I could start to hear it tick. You're going to find out this week, week one, one of the keys for us is to listen. And we, we, we want to be able to listen to God first. And one of the things that you need to know is God is always speaking. Sometimes we're not quiet enough to hear him. We're not still enough to allow him to speak into our life. We're just always moving. We're on the go. We're always busy. And so in order for us to listen, we've got to slow down. That's one of the reasons we talk about every day with Jesus on a regular basis. We've got to, we've got to make that time and slow down like every day so we can hear him. But the listening is not just about hearing him. It's also about hearing the people who are in our life. Think of you who are spouses for just a minute, or maybe if you have a child or you have a, you have a mom and dad, somebody in a close relationship with you. If you've, if you've never read the book, I highly recommend The Five Love Languages. But, but there's something about that that really kind of captured Michelle and I when we went through it the first time. We, we were actually both the same love language, which made it really easy uh, because we both love me. And so it worked out. No, that's not what that means. Anyway, uh, it worked out because we both had the same love language. In fact, one of our girls did, and the other one had a different one. And so we, we wanted to figure that out to make sure that we were demonstrating to them, showing them love in a way that was tangible, where, where they received it. Let me, let me give you a bad example, right? Not from our family, but just for a bad example. And I, and I saw this happen with somebody. His love language was acts of service. And like he wanted to show his wife how much he loved her by serving her. And most women would say, awesome, serve away. Take out the trash, do the dishes, fix, fix that squeaky door, whatever it is. But, but her love language in this particular case was quality time. And so what she really wanted was for him to stop moving around the house and fixing everything that honestly, a lot of those things she could do. And it kind of made her feel like he didn't believe she was capable. She just wanted him to sit down and hold hands and watch a movie. But he was always going and fixing something. It was him trying to show her that I love you. But you know what she heard? You're not able to do this yourself. I better get it done now before we go to bed. It's the importance of understanding love language. It's the importance of listening. 
when somebody's trying to communicate with you, what really helps them, what really makes them feel like important in your life, right? And on the other hand, there's the guy who is married and uh, 30 years later, they're in counseling and you'll, you'll find out why in just a second. <laughs> they're, they're there and, and the, the pastor who's counseling just says, well, you guys have been married for 30 years. What are you doing here? And she said, well, he never tells me that he loves me. And he goes, that's not right. He goes, I told you on our wedding day. And if it ever changed, I'd let you know. <laughs> Come on, man. We need to hear that. We all need to hear that on a regular basis, right? But we also need to hear it in ways, in tangible ways, besides just that verbal phrase, I love you. We need to hear it and see it and experience it in different ways. And we're all different. So we're going to make this commitment. We're going to make this commitment to listen, to get to know these people that God has placed in our life so that we can love them in a way that helps them feel and experience love. But we also want to follow through with the commitment because making the commitment is the easy part. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read this out of the message. It's a little more wordy, but I really like the phrasing of this. He says, so here's what I think. The best thing you could do right now is to finish what you started last year and not let those good intentions grow stale. Your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish it up, so go to it. Once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. The heart regulates the hands. I mean, there's some great lines in there. But I love that one. It's like, don't let those good intentions grow stale. So it's, it's possible to, to listen to a message, a lesson. It's, it's possible to sit there and go, yeah, I agree. I want to I do that better. And then walk out and just the busyness of life allows that good intention to grow stale. So I want to make sure that we are doing what we can to follow through. And by the way, he's actually literally talking right there about them taking up a special offering for people who are really in, in desperate times. He says, we talked about this a year ago. Now it's time to wrap it up. But I, I just like the principle of that. that we got to follow through with those commitments that we make. And so, and we need to put maybe some, some feet on these commitments so that we can start walking. So let me give you a couple other ideas. Number, number two in my list is just identify the withdrawals. You need to know what is costing you in those relationships. You need to know what, what's hurting. And sometimes we're kind of not even aware because we're not paying attention we're not watching the body language. We're not seeing the response that we're getting because of what we just did. And we just think, oh, it's just us. I'm just having fun. But we're not watching our, our spouse or our child just shrink in front of our eyes. We need to identify the withdrawals. I don't know about you, but I love a good name on a boat. Uh, Michelle and I stayed down in a harbor a few years ago down in San Diego, and we got to go on those little those little pedal things, you know, just kind of sit in there and you just pedal and that's what, you know, takes you around the harbor. And we were reading names on boats. It was, it was awesome. Well, I just saw this one recently. Check out the name on this boat. Now who's the loser, dad? And I'm going to admit, at first I laughed too. And then it broke my heart. Right? The, the vulgar, demeaning abusive name-calling, and it, and it can be simple, but it, it's powerful, and it lasts for a long, long time. Ephesians 4.29, he actually begins with the withdrawal, and then he gets to the deposit. He says, like, instead. Okay, so here's the idea. Don't use fuel, or don't use fuel. If you're on a boat, if it's a sailboat, you don't need fuel. No, don't use foul or abusive language, and here's, here's the deposit instead. Let everything you say be good, and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. But by the way, you ever ask yourself, where does all that junk come from? I mean, I, I, I can't believe I just talked to my child that way. I can't believe I talked to my spouse that way. I can't believe, we've been friends for 20 years. I can't believe I said this. Like, that, that's not me. <laughs> yeah, according to Jesus, it is. You may not like this verse, but here it is in Matthew 15, 18. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these are the things that defile them. If you follow me on the 60 Seconds with PJ, just, I'm going through the book of Mark. And in Mark chapter 7, he's talking about the same thing. And he throws an extra verse in there where it says this. And by saying this, because he's saying it's not the food that makes you spiritually unclean. It says, by saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Can you just imagine a Jew hearing that for the first time and going, bacon? 
That'd be awesome. I love that. Jesus declared all foods clean, right? Now we say, no, that's just, it's just not me. I, you know, I, I hit my hand with or my thumb with that hammer and then, boop, but that's just not me. Well, that's where it came from. Like we, we put it in there. We may need God's help getting it out, but that, that's where it is. And that's where the problem is. It's, it's in me. And I got to just own that. Here's a principle to live by. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get this one. If it annoys the people you love the most, are you ready? This is, this is brilliant stuff. I, stop it. If it annoys the people you love the most, stop it. Don't say, but that's just me. They got to love me for me. No, that's just being a jerk, and we're just making it worse, right? Let me, let me give an example. I've told you before that um, English is my second language. Uh, sarcasm is first. Natural, natural sarcasm just started with me when I was very young. But my wife's not always a big fan of it, especially when she's trying to be serious. And she likes it at times. At, at times, she laughs. She thinks it's hilarious, but just not at the right time or the wrong time. And so that's one of those things I've just tried to, I've just tried to cut it out. It, to me, it's still funny. But I know it doesn't help. And I, and I want to have, get this, I want to have a great relationship with her. I don't want to just survive and, and come to that point where we have our 50th anniversary and neither one of us actually like each other, but we made it to the finish line. No, I, I want to thrive. I want to have a great relationship. I love her. And so I, I've tried to work on that. Most of our marriage, like I, I just, I can't bring sarcasm in when it's a serious conversation. And, and one thing I would just encourage you with is real simple as this. Identify those withdrawals and then just eliminate the easy ones. Some of these are not going to be easy to deal with. But some of the easy ones you could go, I could stop doing that. It doesn't really cost me anything. It's okay. Like, I, I could, it's like, stop. Eliminate the easy ones first. Just, just start there. Show, show a little effort, right? Here's another thing. Number three on my list is just discover why withdrawals are there in the first place. Now, this is not easy. This is going to take some introspection. This is going to take some self-evaluation, some honesty. But I love this verse in Proverbs 25, 8. Listen to this. Don't jump to conclusions. There may be a perfectly good explanation for what you just saw. Even if what you just saw was in you. So, so figure out what, what's the explanation, what's going on there, and what, what maybe can I, or I work on or what can I fix? Uh, Bill Gates in... Uh, business at the speed of thought said this. I thought this was super interesting. Listen, he says, a good email system ensures that bad news can travel fast. But your people have to be willing to send you the news. You have to be constantly receptive to bad news. And then you have to act on it. Sometimes I think my most important job as CEO is to listen for bad news. If you don't act on it, your people will eventually stop bringing bad news to your attention. Listen, and that's the beginning of the end. What, what about in our family? What about in our relationships? Are people honest enough to say, that hurts my feelings when you do that? Or have they tried that before and you blew them off and you're obviously not going to work on it or change and so now they just don't bring it up, right? Is that, is that the beginning of the end? What, we've got to be receptive to some of that bad news, even if it's about us, so that we can work on it with the people that we love the most. Here's an idea of what, what does it mean to, to, to find out why the withdrawals were there anyway, to discover this. I talked to someone who was struggling with the fact that whenever anybody in their family did something, they kind of had like, it was kind of a combination of worst case scenario and I really don't jump to the conclusion that this is going to be a good thing. Like I'm always looking like this is, this is probably a bad thing. They, they, their motives are probably not right. There was, like they're questioning everybody. And that's a tough way to live, right? But when you find out a little bit more about them, you find out that that was the, the family they grew up in. And nothing they could do could please their dad. And, and nothing they could say would make their mom happy with their explanation. It's like it was just never, ever good enough. And so then they begin to look at their family the same way, with that same lens. But, but they were able to work on it. They, they figured out why they were doing that. And then they were able to say, you know what? I don't want to be like that. And they stopped that cycle. They, like, they had a clean break from that. But here's the thing I really want us to kind of uh, understand before we move on this week. 
And that's number four. And that's, let's make some deposits. So our commitment, we, we need to deal with some withdrawal issues, but let's, let's start making some deposits immediately. And I'm going to show you what the key deposit week one is, but let me, let me read something for you because this came out of the uh, Massachusetts uh, Bar Association. These are actual transcripts from court. Um, and it's like the questioning and the answering of, of a witness. So just listen to this. She had three children, right? Yes. How many were boys? None. Were there any girls? Okay, follow me. Here's another one. You say the stairs went down to the basement. Yes. And these stairs, did they also go up? You can see this is like lawyers just really having a great time here, right? Here's another one. How was your first marriage terminated? By death. And by whose death was it terminated? Okay. How about this one? Can you describe the individual? He was about medium height and had a beard. Was he male or female? Here's another one. Doctor, how many autopsies have you performed on dead people? The doctor says, all my autopsies were performed on dead people, right? Here's another one. Do you recall the time that you examined the body? Well, the autopsy started at 8.30 p.m. And Mr. Dennington, was he dead at the time? The doctor, no. He was sitting on the table wondering why I was doing an autopsy. <laughs> Here's one last one. Mr. Slattery, you went on a rather elaborate honeymoon, didn't you? I went to Europe, sir. And you took your new wife? Well, I read those, and I'm just sitting there going, seriously, people? Because you know what's going on. The lawyer is not listening. He just wants to say what he's prepared to say, right? I don't know if that happens in anybody else's house. We don't really listen. We're just waiting for their mouth to stop moving so we can say what we want to say. And maybe we look that ridiculous if somebody was just watching from a distance, right? We need to really listen. And in fact, if we could just say, Here, here's the deposit homework for this week. We, we want to listen. I read somewhere a few years back that the typical United States married couple spends four minutes a day, this is their, their term, in meaningful conversation, four minutes a day. That's it. That's 0.3% of the hours in a day. And so if we're going to listen, we need to make sure that we have some space and some time to do this. Now, I've always been a huge advocate for dinner time, and that means turning off the phones, turning off the television, turning off all those kind of devices, and literally like looking at each other at the table. Some people are like, table? What, what is this you talk of? Get a table and sit around it, right? And, and what we used to do and when the kids were little, like not only would we, we, we talk, we would actually have a board game on the table. And after dinner, we would just start playing. It just kept us at the table longer together so that we could hang out. And it could be as simple as Yahtzee or a little marble game or whatever it was. It just gave us a chance to hang out and talk. But ladies, let me give you a little clue about your man. I don't even have to know anything about your man. I don't, I'm not talking about being a stereotypical thing here, but, but I just know this is true about every man on the planet, period. There are no exceptions. So you're like, what? <laughs> ladies are wired typically to where you like to sit down when you want to really be heard and you want to listen and you want to have a conversation. You're, you're prepared to sit down knee to knee, eye to eye. And I've watched you ladies doing it, and it freaks us guys out. I'm just going to, it freaks us out, right? We've talked about this in the past. It's like, if you want to have a conversation with a guy, don't look at him in the eye. He thinks you're robbing his soul. Like, you can look at him occasionally, but don't just like knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball. Don't do that. In fact, here's what you could do. If you say like, you know what, we just, we, we need more than four minutes just to have a meaningful conversation. Here's a great way to do that. Get in your car and go run some errands together. I don't know, get some ice cream at Rite Aid. I hear sometimes they give you a whole lot of ice cream. <laughs> if you were here last week, you'd get that. 
But, but you get in the car together, side by side, and, and listen, ladies, you just ask him questions, he'll talk, because he's just driving, he's not even thinking about it. Or maybe you're driving and he's over there and you're just like, ask him a question, he's enjoying the ride. You're not looking into his soul, but you're able to listen, just the two of you. So maybe it's a family time, you want to be around the table, maybe it's just the two of you, you want to go, go out, turn the TV off and just go outside and sit on the patio. But I think running errands is just a, a super way for guys to do it because there's something about us just sitting there like we're, we're afraid. We're afraid you're going to ask us something we can't answer. We're, going to, we're afraid that you know, when you said we need to talk, that, that never sounds good. How about, hey, I want to talk. Is this a, is this a trick statement? What's going on here? Let's go get some ice cream. Now, ice cream, and if you want to rub your shoulders, that, that's good too. That'll help. All of this will help. I'm just going to tell you, we want to make sure that we listen. And it's something we all could work on. Charles Swindoll, famous pastor and writer, was in Orange County for years. He wrote a book called uh, Stress Fractures. And I'm just going to read you part of this story because uh, it might connect with you and, and the busyness of, of your life like mine sometimes. He says, I vividly remember some time back being caught in the undertow of too many commitments in too few days. It wasn't long before I was snapping at my wife and our children, choking down my food at mealtimes and feeling irritated at those unexpected interruptions throughout the day. Before long, things around our home started reflecting the pattern of my hurry up style. It was becoming unbearable. I distinctly recall after supper one evening the words of our younger daughter, Colleen. She wanted to tell me about something important that, she had, that, that had happened to her at school that day. She hurriedly began, Daddy, I want to tell you something, and I'll tell you really fast. Suddenly, uh, re suddenly realizing her frustration, I answered, Honey, you can tell me, and you don't have to tell me really fast. Say it slowly. He says, I'll never forget her answer. She said, then listen slowly, Daddy. Listen slowly. That's your homework this week. It's not like rocket science. But you have friends in your life. You have family in your life. A spouse. You have kids. You have people maybe you work with it that mean a lot to you. It's like, listen slowly. And remember, this is going to be our plan for week one. In fact, listen to this in Proverbs 14, 22. If you plan to do evil, you will be lost. If you plan to do good, you will receive unfailing love and faithfulness. So we're going to plan to do good. And a good friendship is cultivated over time. Right? A good, a good a relationship with our kids is, is, is cultivated and developed and nurtured. A, a great marriage is, is, is something that we work on. We, we invest in. There's got to be deposits in that kind of a relationship. But I want to take this even a step further. Some of you may be in a relationship where you're the only one that cares what's going on spiritually in your household. And that happens. And I know how difficult it is, and I've talked with some of you, and I pray with some of you about that. So let me just say this to those of you who are single. If the most important thing in your life is Jesus, then don't date somebody unless they love Jesus. Don't marry somebody unless they love Jesus. I mean, the Bible literally talks about this whole thing, like being unequally yoked. It's like if the most important thing in our life is this relationship we have with God, then we want somebody who has our back when, when the world comes at us with both barrels. We, we need somebody who can stand with us. And so, like I said in the beginning, it's like we're going to do this, but we want to do this founded on, based on the wisdom and the word of God. And so where I want to wrap this up, and we're going to go to a time of communion in a moment, is I just want to wrap this up by, by thinking about the deposit that God made in our lives with what he did on the cross for us. I mean, the first step in making good deposits in your relationship with those you love is, is to follow his example, to, to learn more about what Jesus is all about. Romans 8, 3 says this. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weaknesses of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us 
by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. I mean, the most relation, important relationship we can have that will affect every other relationship that we have is a relationship with our God. It's a relationship with Jesus. And so for those of us who, who know him and have committed our life to him, communion to us is, is really special and it's really personal because we know that he gave his life for, for me, you know, for, for my sin. His body on that cross for me, his, his blood shed to pay the price for my sin. And at Community, what we've been doing for some time now is uh, we have trays on the front side of the room and there's two cups in those. And at home, you're going to be doing this. Go grab uh, some bread or crackers and juice, and you can join and do this with us. But we're going to sing a song in just a moment. Justin's going to lead us through that. But as he does that, you're, you'll be dismissed to go get those cups. And maybe if there's a couple of you, maybe just one of you can go so we're not everybody standing by the tables. But go, go get what you need for your family. And then after this song, I want us just to spend some time remembering what Christ did for us. I, I want us to remember the deposit that he made as he invested in this relationship with us. But before we, I, I release you to do that, I, I want to pray for you. Because like I said, this, this, for those of us who know Christ, this is special to us. For those of you who may not, and maybe you're watching this too, and you're like, I, I want to know more. <laughs> Just email us at office at community.cc. We'd love to talk to you more about what that means. And if you're here, maybe after the service, just come up and find somebody. There'll be people up here willing to pray with you, talk with you. If you have questions about what does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus, how do I, how do, I do that? We, we'd love to talk to you about that stuff. Well, let's pray. God, we thank you for your love, your grace. We thank you for the way that you, you came to our rescue. And God, for the next several weeks, all we just talk about relationships. We can't talk about any of these relationships without, first of all, just acknowledging what you've done for us. And so we thank you for the cross. We thank you for that sacrifice. And we thank you for the life and the hope that you give us through Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can go get those items now. And in just a moment, we'll partake together. cross I look to the cross I cling of its suffering I do dream of its work I do see for all in my Savior both bruised and crushed show that God's love and God is just at the cross you beckon me draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words, so lost in love and I am sweetly broken, holy surrender at the cross of you that can me, draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words. Scripture says that God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. When we talk about deposits of love, man, there's none greater than that, right? Jesus, when he was with his disciples, 
says in Mark chapter 14, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, for this is my body. God, we thank you. God, we thank you for loving us through your son, Jesus. God, whose body was broken and beaten, put on a cross so that we have the opportunity to be made right with you. God, we thank you for that act of love, that care for us. Your body, God. We thank you. So with that, let's go ahead and take the bread together, remembering Christ's broken body. He continues here. He says, and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice for many. So remembering that covenant that God made between himself and us, it's a promise. Let's go ahead and take that cup together. Thanking Jesus that he was willing to pay that price on the cross, to shed his blood for us. And it's the ultimate display of love. Let's pray together as we close this time out. God, we thank you for this reminder this reminder of, of this covenant, of this promise that you've made with us. We thank you that, that, that you sent Jesus for us. God, help us to live and love the way that you've displayed to us. Help us to make sacrifices. Help us to make deposits. all those lives that you put in contact with us. God, we thank you for this evening, for this church, for this place to be with friends and family. God, we thank you for the child dedications, the baby dedications, God. God, I thank you that, that these parents want to raise their kids in a godly way to tell them about you, God. God help, us to, help us to encourage these families us to root them on. God, we thank you again. We love you. We thank you for loving us. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Hey, we are so glad that you chose to join us tonight, Thursday night, or online whenever you're pulling this up. Hey, uh, we just want you to know that, that we love you guys, and, and if you guys need prayer, you can head up front. If not, uh, if you're in person, there's ice cream on your way out. If you're online, uh, I guess go to Rite Aid. Have a great night. <laughs>